begin with a prayer. Father, today we pray that you would open our hearts and minds and help us as we look into your word to understand these things called angels, that we might see their part in your plan and that we might be able to bring into a proper perspective uh, what your word has to say about them with all of the, the teachings and doctrines about angels that are going around today. Help us to be able to uh, apply the principles that you give us in your word to fully understand their place in our Christian walk. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, today we'll be talking about the doctrine of angels, known theologically as angelology. Throughout Scripture, the mention of angels takes place in both the Old and the New Testaments. Noted as celestial beings, Angels are mentioned 108 times in the Old Testament and 165 in the New. In the Hebrew, the word angel is translated from the word malak, which means dispatched as a deputy or messenger. That is, an angel, a prophet, a priest, or a teacher, so on. In the Greek, the word agalos means the same thing. It means a bringer of tidings, so a messenger and is translated as celestial beings and human beings. Characteristic of, of angels. Angels are created beings. Now this is fundamental to understanding angelology. They are created beings. They are not eternal. There is only one eternal being and that is God. Colossians uh, chapter 1 verses 16 and 17. This would be number one on your outlines. Uh, Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him all things were created. Now if an angel is a thing, that means they were created. All things were created by God, including those things seen and those things unseen. Number two, let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. This will be number two on your outlines under angels are created beings. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. He says, You alone are Jehovah. You made the heaven, you made the heaven of heavens and all their host, and the earth and all the things in it, the sea and all that is in them, and you preserve them all, and the host of heaven worships you, because the host of heaven was made by Jehovah. So he says, You have made everything, even the things of heaven. Okay, angels are neither male nor female. Now, they're usually depicted as masculine beings and they're given masculine names. But Jesus said, and uh, this will be number one, Matthew twenty-two thirty, that angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. And this was uh, in reference to the, the trick that the Sadducees had tried to pull on him where they tried to back him into a corner to say if a person had... Uh, many marriages on earth uh, due to the spouses dying. You give the example of the woman who uh, had seven husbands because they kept dying and she would marry the brother according to the law and then he would die and then she would marry the next brother and so on. And they said whose husband would she have when in the resurrection? And Jesus was trying to explain to them that they had misunderstood this whole concept of the spiritual or celestial realm. And to explain it to him he said they're just like angels. Because angels don't have husbands and wives and, and they are just like a uh, genderless creation. Okay, angels are many in number. Number one would be Psalm 68, 17. Let's turn to that one. Psalm 68, 17. Psalms chapter 68 and verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as in Sinai, in the holy place. Now in the Hebrew, they didn't have a, a, a very good... Once you got past thousands, when you use the term thousands, they began to lose concept of, of large numbers. And when, when they would use the phrase thousands of thousands, this would be an ambiguous term, would be bordering on infinity. They weren't trying to say infinite, but what they were saying is more than I can count. They're numberless, in other words. Okay, New Testament, ref uh, 
reference would be number 2, Hebrews 12.22. So let's look up Hebrews 12.22 in the New Testament. This will go on number 2 on your outlines. Uh, C2. Hebrews 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. So in the Greek language, they've got a little better concept of something that might be beyond number. And even still, the number of angels are so numerous that they say they're an innumerable company. Not infinite but just thousands upon thousands upon thousands. Millions, if you like. An innumerable company. Okay, D. Angels can eat. Now let's look up Genesis chapter 18, and probably what we'll be doing today, well, what we will be doing today, is a lot of scripture hopping. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about angels. They are, they, as we said in the uh, opening statement, that angels... Uh, appear in practically every aspect of God's plan for man. But there's so much about angels that go uh, out in some of the teachings that are going around today that uh, it's a good thing to have some sort of a, a systematic approach to understanding angelology. So what we'll be doing in this class is going over a lot of verses and all of these blanks on your outline basically will be scripture references uh, categorized into, into the different categories. So Genesis 18, beginning with verse 2. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the ground, and said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a, wa let, let a little water be brought, wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. And after that you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. And they said, Do as you've said. So Abraham hastened to the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly make ready three majors of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a tender and good calf and gave it to a young man and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. And so we, here we have a, a reference to angels that had came to uh, Abraham and the fact that they, in human form or in human appearance, as they manifested themselves as men, had the capacity to be able to eat. We see the same thing in, in uh, the next chapter when two of these angels uh, were sent on into uh, Sodom to pick up Lot and his family, and as they uh, resided with, with Lot that evening, he did the same thing, where he prepared a meal for them. And you can see, this is also on number one, uh, chapter 19, verse 3. When they saw Lot, they also ate. Okay, as a poetic metaphor, under number two, you could put Psalm 78, verses 24 and 25. And this is a David taking a poetic look at the whole subject, where he, he made the, the analogy of the manna that fell in the desert when the uh, children of Israel were walking around in the wilderness. In, in Psalm 78, verses 24 and 25, David calls this angel's food. Now this isn't to say that the angels sat around up in heaven uh, munching on manna all the time, but you can see this poetic uh, metaphor that, that he uses. Okay, E, what angels look like. Now, the artist's renditions occur quite often. Some of them are accurate and some of them are maybe least accurate or less accurate. Uh, we can see a lot of the, the paintings that took place during the Renaissance in, uh, at the end of the Middle Ages. And uh, again, some of these you know, may, might fit in with what an angel really looks like. But we need to keep in mind that we're talking about spiritual beings, celestial beings, uh, the fourth dimension, if you will. And so therefore, to talk and say this is the physical representation of an angel 
is uh, maybe not the best way of putting it. But the angels have appeared at many times in Scripture under various forms. So we'll just take a, a quick look at a few of those. First, uh, again, Genesis chapter 18, number 2, verse 2. This would be on number one on your outlines. It says, So he lifted his eyes and looked. Behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. Now we see Abraham noticed that there was something different about these three men. They weren't just your typical vagabond uh, travelers walking around uh, out in the desert. When he saw them, he realized there was something different about him, and he went and bowed himself in the in the uh, customary Eastern fashion. And he knew there was there there was something about their appearance that struck him as a man of God, and who was in tune to to the things of God in spiritual matters. Realized that he was in the presence of something. A little out of the ordinary. Uh, the same thing happened in chapter 19. This would be number 2. Where the same angels appeared to Lot. And he recognized the fact that there was something different about them. And he too bowed himself toward the ground. Okay, Genesis, this is number 3. Genesis chapter 28. Let's look that one up. 28 verse 12. The famous story of Jacob's ladder. Genesis 28 verse 12. This is number three on your outlines. Then he dreamed, and behold, the ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac, and the land which you lie I will give to your descendants. So here we see the, the vision of the angels of heaven going up and down these ladders of... Uh, in, in Jacob's dream and Jacob in his dream recognizing these as being angels now were these creatures in white robes with with little halos and big white wings we don't know but there was something that distinguished them in Jacob's dream that he realized that th these were angelic beings okay uh, number four Deuteronomy chapter or er, numbers chapter 22 let's look that one up Numbers chapter 22. Now some of these scripture references that I give we will look up specifically and others uh, I just like you to write down and you look them up later because there are so many we wouldn't have time to look them all up. And some of them are more or less just support references for the ones that we will be looking up. So Numbers chapter 22 beginning with verse 22. This is the story of Balaam and his donkey. Numbers chapter 22, verse 22. Then God's anger was aroused because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood his, took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey and to turn her back onto the road. Then the angel of the, Lord, of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, so he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, and she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you strike me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? He said, No. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. I guess what really trips me out about this passage is the fact that Balaam is doing this thing. He's, going on, he's on his way to curse the Israelites. And God has decided that he's not going to uh, allow him. So he sends his angel draws his sword, and he's going to do Balaam in. Well, the donkey 
by divine appointment, was allowed to see the angel standing here with his sword drawn. And he attempted to go the other way. He didn't want to walk into something as fearsome as this. And three times the donkey tried to change Balaam's mind. And after the third time, the donkey began to talk to him. He opened his mouth and began to speak. Balaam is so bent on bringing about this plan of his to go curse the Israelites that the fact that this mule talking to him doesn't even freak him out. And he just begins to carry on a conversation with him. But the point being here that there was an angel with a sword drawn at the end of the path and the donkey recognized this as being something supernatural and then once, once uh, Balaam was allowed to see he also recognized this as being something supernatural. So we can see in all of these instances so far, uh, although the scripture doesn't tell us what the difference is, we see something more than the appearance of an ordinary man. But in most cases, it wasn't something that just totally freaked them out. You know, but they saw something that was more than just an ordinary human appearance. All right, number five. Now we'll get into some of the really freaky stuff. Ezekiel chapter 10. Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 10. And we'll see a description of an angel here. This is a vision of Ezekiel that he had. And uh, this is a little different depiction, I believe, than some of these that we've seen prior to this. Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 10. This is number 5 on your outlines. As for their appearance, all four looked alike as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And when they went, they went forward, they went toward any of their four directions, and they did not turn aside when they went, but followed in the direction the head was facing. And they did not turn aside when they went. And their whole body with their back and their hands and their wings and the wheels that the four had were full of eyes all around. As for the wheels, they were called in my hearing, wheel. And each one had four faces, and the first face of the fa was the face of a cherub, and the second face the face of a man, and the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. And the cherubim were lifted up, and this was the living creature I saw by the river Kibar. Now he starts off in chapter 1 with a similar vision of, of the same creature while he was by the river Kibar. And it says... Uh, he describes uh, the same scene then as he does now. Only he adds in where he says in, in, uh, in verse 14 that the face of the, the first face was the face of a cherub. And in his vision in chapter 1, he said that this was the face of an ox. And so we see here that we have this creature with four faces. One is the face of an ox. Two is the face of a man. Third, the face of a lion. And fourth, the face of an eagle. And most commentators believe that this is a depiction of the four Gospels, where each one of the Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, was writing for a specific purpose. Each one of them is giving, uh, if you will, a different side of the face of Christ. It was like a view of Christ from four different views. Matthew being uh, the Jew and writing his Gospel to the Jews, depicted Jesus as the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Jewish prophecies concerning the Messiah, as the king, the king that the Jews were looking for. And scholars say that this might uh, fit in with the third face, the face of a lion, lion always being symbolic of royalty and kinghood, kingship. Uh, Mark, on the other hand, writes his gospel and brings the sight of Christ not being so much in his majesty as a king, but as being a servant. The fact that Christ came to be a servant of man. And this would be depicted in, in the uh, example of one of the faces, in chapter 1 anyway, of Ezekiel, depicts this four-faced creature as being having the face of an ox. An ox always is, is a, a type of servant in Scripture. You know, the, the ox is always the work beast, uh, plowing the field, and always being, that's what the, the ox does is serve. And third would be uh, uh, Luke, who represents Christ as being the Son of Man, or the humanity of Christ. The fact that God incarnate was fully human. And so we see that uh, 
the second face of this creature was the face of a man. And then lastly, we see the fourth face was the face of a lion. Or the face of an eagle, I'm sorry. The fourth face is the face of an eagle. Typically speaking, the eagle is, is uh, symbolic of deity. And so this would fit in with John chapter 4, the fact that he represents Christ as being the Son of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. So we can see, but then he goes on to say that this was a cherub. And so this vision that Ezekiel saw was not only a prophecy concerning the fourfold gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but it was also an angelic being covered with eyes, demonstrating the omniscience of this being. Uh, scholars don't fully understand this vision, and you might run across several different expositions of it and commentaries, but we just really don't fully understand it. But we have an idea that he was just trying to demonstrate uh, the fourfold aspect of the Gospels as they represented Christ. Pretty trippy picture anyway. Okay, number six on your outlines, Daniel chapter 6, verse 22. We won't look this up. Uh, very famous, very well-known uh, story about Daniel in the lion's den. Okay, Daniel was put in the lion's den, made the, the king mad, and so the king put him in the lion's den, and uh, they looked in, and they found out that the angel had came and held the lion's mouth shut so that they couldn't, they didn't even scratch him or bite him or anything. He was protected by an angel. Uh, says that he looked like the Son of Man. Matthew 28, verses 2, two to 5, this is after the resurrection. And we can see that the, when the people went to the tomb, they found an angel sitting there. And the first words out of the angel's mouth was, Fear not. Fear not, for he whom you seek is risen. And you'll notice in the New Testament, any time that it, it or, or usually in the New Testament, when an angel speaks, he usually has to start off with fear not. Don't freak out at what you're seeing. You know, they would come and they'd see this angel and usually the descriptions in the New Testament are showing them as being this kind of a magnificent creature because they're so snow white and all. And, and the angels usually, the angel that came to Mary, for example, and the angel that came to Joseph in his dream, usually they end up having to say, don't be afraid, I just come to give you a message and I'm not going to hurt you, I'll leave you alone. Okay, number eight. Let's look, look up Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verses 10 to 11. And this, also, this is number 8 on your outlines. Acts chapter 1, verse 10. And while they stood steadfastly looking toward heaven as he went up, this is Jesus when he ascended to heaven, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So we see a description here of their clothing, the fact that they were wearing white raiment. Uh, angels are typically pictured this way. They're always wearing these white robes and everything. And this is part of the reason because they're always depicted as uh, wearing white. Symbol of their purity. Okay, number nine, Revelation chapter 10. We'll have another example. Revelation chapter 10. It's number nine on your outlines. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. Angels are depicted in very, wet, very many and various ways in the book of Revelation. And here we have one. He begins, he says, I saw, in verse 1, still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had a little book open in his hand. Now whether or not this angel was actually clothed wearing a cloud or he was actually had a rainbow on his head and actually had pillars of fires on his feet is, uh, is hard to say. This is probably uh, symbolic uh, usage of words here because what John saw in the language of his day, that's the best he could do to describe it. I don't think he was being symbolic so much as he was just describing it as well as his vocabulary and knowledge of physical things could go. 
So we see that he was clothed with a cloud, rainbow, sun, his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. So it's a pretty awesome picture he saw here. That was number nine. Uh, number ten, we won't look this one up, you can just write it in. Hebrews 13.2 is the one that says that some have entertained angels unawares. This is talking about the fact that you need to be nice to uh, little old ladies and help them across the street and things like that because you never know that maybe you just entertained an angel without knowing it. Uh, not to be dogmatic on that because this word, this Greek word agalos, which we said in the introduction means messenger, is also translated messenger in other places in scripture. Let's turn real quick and this can go on number 10 also to James chapter 2. There's a couple other examples in, in uh, Luke but this one in James will uh, will demonstrate what we're what we're trying to say here. James chapter 2 verse 25 this is where he's talking about the story about uh, Rahab and he says, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Now we know from the Old Testament uh, reference to this that these weren't angels that he, she received and then sent out on their way, that these were spies. These were a couple of Israelites that had come to her uh, for help and she helped them and then let them down you know, by the rope and the scarlet thread and... Okay, so we can see that the word messenger is not necessarily to be, or the word agalos is not necessarily to be translated as angel in every case. So in Hebrews chapter 13 where it talks about entertaining angels unawares, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that that's not what that scripture is talking about, but you, as we can see, you can't really be dogmatic in that way. It could just simply be that we've entertained a messenger from God. Uh, in some way or another. Okay, now, number three types of angels. Types of angels. We have archangels. Now, there are several people who teach that there are or have been three archangels. The teaching is that the archangels are Lucifer, Gabriel, and Michael. But this has no scriptural support whatsoever. Again, the word arch means chief or principal, means the number one. And so you could really only have one number one angel looking at just what the word arch means. And the only place in scripture where it refers to an archangel, uh, there are two scriptural references and both of them are referring to the same person or the same angel, which is Michael in Jude chapter 9 and 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Okay, Michael is the only archangel named in scripture. Now underneath this you can have number one, he's the prime minister of God's administration of the universe. The prime minister of God's administration of the universe. This is Michael's function. He's the chief of the cap, he's the captain of the host, of the angelic host. The prime minister of God's administration of the universe. Number two, under Michael, he's the angel administrator of God's judgment. This is his other function. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 12. All this is under number 2 on Michael. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was there any place found for them in heaven any longer. So we can see that, that Michael is not only the prime minister of God's administration of the universe, but he's also the administrator of God's judgment. So he, doesn't, he not only oversees the universe as the way you know, things go on day-to-day -day basis, but he also is the administrator of God's judgment. And he's the one that, that uh, leads the battle against Satan and when, when this whole thing of uh, uh, Satan and his followers being cast out of heaven. Okay, B, you have Daniel 12, 1. Let's turn to that in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Daniel 12, 1. 
here we see Michael again. He says, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as, as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. Uh, it talks about him a couple chapters earlier in 10.21. We won't look that one up. But let, let's look up in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. This is a good way to learn the books of the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So we can conclude from this that since Michael is the only one referred to as being the archangel in Jude verse 9, that in... 1 Thessalonians 4.16, this reference is to Michael. Okay, so this is uh, the Bible references of, to archangels, or the archangel more specifically. Okay, angels. Now there are four types of, of angels. Archangels, and then just regular old angels, messenger angels, and that's what we'll talk about now. The regular angels that we think about, the kind that we have been seeing in most of the uh, scriptural references that we've looked up so far, are uh, just the regular old messenger type angels. Primary example of these in scripture is Gabriel. Gabriel appears four times in scripture and his name means hero of God. Gabriel's name means hero of God. He appears four times in Scripture. Uh, these Scripture references are Daniel 8, verse 15 and 16. We won't look these up, but you can write them down. Just put these underneath Gabriel. Daniel 8, verses 15 and 16. And this is where Gabriel comes to interpret Daniel's vision. He comes to interpret Daniel's vision about the ram. And then in uh, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, verse 21, he comes also to interpret the famous vision about the 70 weeks. Daniel's vision about God's plan for the church and, and, and the millennium kingdom. He comes and interprets the 77s of Daniel's vision and tells him that, you know, there'll be such and so many weeks that'll stand for this, and then there'll be a period of time, and then the seventh week, and... And, and on and on. Okay, third, we have Luke chapter 1, verse 19. Luke 1, 19. And this is the story about Zacharias, who had been told he would have a son, and his son shall be named John. Well, the angel that brought this message and told him this was the angel Gabriel. Zacharias was in the Holy of Holies, ministering to the Lord, and... and the angel appeared to him in there and gave him the prophecy. He said, you'll have a son and he'll be a, a, a good guy. And you name him John. And then Zacharias lost his voice until that time because he doubted what the angel was saying. He didn't really trust the, uh, Gabriel. And then uh, a few verses later, in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, Gabriel again, same angel, he comes to bring the message of the Messiah to Mary. And he brings God, out God's plan for, for all mankind and, and vocalizes this to Mary. Calls her blessed among women. So these are the four times that Gabriel is depicted in Scripture. And he's the only messenger angel that's named. There's only three angels named in Scripture. Uh, we've talked about two of them so far, Michael and Gabriel. Now in the Apocrypha, there's a reference to a, a third angel. I believe it's in the book of Susanna or Bell and the Dragon. One of those two uh, talks about the angel Raphael. But uh, there's no scriptural support for this. There's no scriptural reference to a Raphael in, in the Old Testament or the New Testament either. Okay, B. Angel who brings God's knowledge to help them in need. This is one of the duties of the messenger angels. Let's look up uh, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And then you can look on down to verse 19. He says, But when Herod was, was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young, chi young child's life are dead. So we can see that the angels are used by God to bring help to people in times of need. Uh, a couple other examples of this would be Acts chapter 27, verse 23. And this is the story where Paul was in the, the ship being held captive and, and he was a prisoner and he was in the ship and there was a tempest at sea and uh, an angel appeared. Everybody thought they were going to die and, and, and all of this. But an angel appeared to Paul and said, it's okay, no one's life is going gonna, is gonna to be lost but you will lose the ship and all your possessions. But be fear because, or have no fear because uh, the Lord is watching over your health. And so he went and told everybody this and sure enough that's what happened. And then third, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. And we have an example of the angel that was given the commission to preach the everlasting gospel. So this angel was given this commission to bring forth the gospel of God to the people forever. Okay, those are the angel type angels, the messenger angels. You're common everyday variety. Now thirdly, we have the seraphim. Now, the I am at the, on the end of seraphim and cherubim is, is a Hebrew suffix that means plurality, such as Elohim. So, singular would be seraph and plural would be seraphim. The title seraphim speaks of increasing worship, love, and it has an idea of a burning one. Example, scriptural, scriptural example is Isaiah chapter 6. We can turn to that one. Isaiah chapter 6. Beginning with verse 1. And in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting up on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken from the tongs of the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. So here we have an example in Scripture of the seraphim and their administration. They praise, this would be on number one underneath Isaiah 6.1, they praise the name and character of God in heaven. Their ministry relates directly to God and His heavenly throne. They praise the name and character of God in heaven. That's their job, to praise the name and character of God. Their ministry relates directly to God and His heavenly throne. They have direct relation to God. And they are in position above the throne and not beside it. And this is significant as we get into this more you'll see. Uh, typically in art, especially Renaissance art, you know the, the writings of Raphael and, or the pictures of Raphael and, and some of those other dudes, uh, these are the little babies with the towels wrapped around them that are flying around up above the, the throne of God. Uh, or they are, they're the ones that are flying around above the nativity scene and things like this. These are the seraphim. But uh, you know, they don't, we don't have any scriptural support for the fact that they look like little, cute little fat babies. But they are the ones who praise the character of God in heaven and relate directly to God in His heavenly throne. 
positioned above the throne, flying above the throne. Notice it says in Isaiah that they had six wings. Two, they covered their face because they were in the presence of God. Two, they covered their feet. And the other two, they used to fly. Okay, the fourth angel mentioned in Scripture, the fourth type of angel mentioned in Scripture, are the cherubim. Or singular would be cherub. Cherubim. This title speaks of their high and holy position. It speaks of their high and holy position. And responsibility is as is closely related to the throne of God. Okay, they are closely re related to the throne of God. As defenders of his character and presence. The cherubim are the defender angels. Cherubim are the defender angels. And we'll see that as we'll go through a few uh, scriptural uh, references here. And you can put all of these references, scriptural references, on number two on your outlines. First one we'll look at is Psalms 80. Psalms 80, verse 1. Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherub, shine forth. Okay, he talks about uh, the shepherd of Israel who dwells between the cherub, shine forth. Now let's look at uh, Psalms 99 and then we'll put these two together. Psalm 99 verse 1. So we've had 80, Psalm 80, verse 1, and Psalm 99, verse 1. He says in verse 1 of Psalm 99, The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. Let the earth be moved. Okay. The Lord dwells between the cherubim. So we can see... This is true uh, literally in heaven and also true symbolically with the Ark of the Covenant. We'll get to in a minute. But the cherubim, as defenders of his character and presence, are positioned on either side of his throne. And the presence of God is between them. Okay, uh, let's look up uh, Exodus chapter 23. or I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25, verse 18. God, when he's given the instructions to Moses about the building of the uh, Ark of the Covenant, he says that you shall make two cherubim of gold, hammered of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. And you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And they shall face one another, and the faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. So the lid on the Ark of the Covenant, on top of the lid, which was called the mercy seat, God was saying, make these two cherub, cherubim. And they would be facing toward each other with their heads bowed and their wings spread out in front of them. And the wingtips would end up touching each other. And they would, it would be like one piece of gold that would form these two uh, characters. The reason for this is later we found out that the Lord dwelt between the two cherubim. And as we say that the cherub, cherubim were the defenders of God's character and His holiness, and His presence. Okay, fourth reference, Genesis chapter 3. Now we'll begin to see how the cherub, cherubim uh, take their place in God's plan outside of the fact that they are defenders of His, of his character and presence on His throne. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, or verse 24. This is after the fall. God's already passed out the curses and he told Adam and Eve, you can't live in the garden anymore. So he drove out the man, verse 24, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden with a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the tree, guard the way to the tree of life. So after he drove out Adam and Eve, 
He placed cherubim at the gates to the entrance of the garden with flaming swords uh, in order to defend the garden and prevent anyone from coming in to eat of the tree of life. That was Genesis 3.24. And then lastly, back to Ezekiel chapter 10. This is the place that we were at earlier with, you know, the, uh, the wheel within a wheel and covered with eyes. Gen uh, Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 1. And I looked, and there in the firmament w that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared something like a sapphire having the appearance and the likeness of a stone. And he spoke to the man clothed with linen and said, Go in among the wheels under the cherub and fill your hands with coals of the fire um, from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And I watched. And now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in and the cloud filled the inner court. And the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and paused over the threshold of the temple and the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. So there we see some scriptural references to, the, to uh, cherub and cherubim in scripture. Their position are, they're like the soldier angels, okay, the warrior angels. So the four types of angels that we see are archangels, which is Michael, the only archangel, messenger angels, and the, the example we have, predominant example we have of that in scripture is Gabriel. We have the seraphim that refers in Isaiah chapter 6, and then we have the cherubim mentioned many times in scripture. Uh, those that teach that Satan was a, uh, an archangel before Michael, scripture says that uh, Satan was the anointed cherub, which we'll talk about later on. But there's no, no reference to the fact that uh, Satan was uh, ever an archangel or that Gabriel is an archangel. They both had different purposes. They had different uh, positions as far as their creation goes. Okay, why don't we stop here and take a break and then we'll uh, come back after that and finish up. Okay, before the break we talked about the different types of angels. Now we'll talk about uh, specifically the fallen angels. The fallen angels. There's a distinction made in scripture as to the angels, although all angels were created by God to worship God, some withhold their praise at this time. And these will designate as fallen angels. And we'll talk about uh, fallen angels, where they came from, and uh, the various theories that go into that as we go along. First of all, Lucifer. Lucifer is known as uh, the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians chapter 2 and a couple other places. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's also known as the angel of light and several other handles that uh, scripture lays on him. A, these are some of his names and titles. And you can write these all under A on Lucifer. He's called a serpent. And this shows his guile, his deceitfulness. A serpent is always a type of deceitfulness. He's also called the devil. There's only one devil, and that's Lucifer. Devil means accuser or slanderer. That's one of his titles, is accuser or slanderer. He's also known as Satan, and this is the name that he's known at as predominantly in the New Testament. The word Satan means adversary or resistor, one who contends adversary or resistor. That's the meaning of the word Satan. Another title that he's known by or name is that of Apollyon in the New Testament, Apollyon, A-P-O-L-L-Y-O-N. 
A-P-O-L-L-Y-O-N. Apollyon. That means destroyer. Destroyer. And he's also referred to, uh, especially in Revelation, as the dragon. And the dragon is kind of the accumulation of all of these other titles and speaks about his power. It implies his power. So he's known as serpent, devil, Satan, Apollyon, and dragon. Okay, all these are under A on your outline. B, who he was. Who he was. And we find that out in Ezekiel chapter 28. Who Lucifer was in the beginning. Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning with verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say unto him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, the topaz, and diamond, the beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. So we see here that this king of Tyre was a created being. And we'll see later that this, that this is a metaphor for uh, Lucifer. He says in the next verse, You were the anointed cherub who covers. Remember the purpose of the cherubim with their wings folded forward and as a protection. He says, I established you and you were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in all your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. So we see that Lucifer was created. This verse tells us a lot. He was created. He was perfect in all his ways. But then iniquity was found in him. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing, and destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor, and I cast you to the ground, and laid you before kings, that they might gaze at you. So we see that Lucifer was created perfect, but then iniquity was found in him. As he began to look at himself and began to see that he was quite a picture, that he was quite a sight, and he began to think that I am something and I am somebody. And as he did that, pride began to well up in him. And we can see pride is the beginning point of all iniquity. And as it began to well up in Satan, then iniquity was found in him, and he was cut off. Okay, C, under Lucifer, C, what he did. What he was was the anointed cherub, and all of these precious jewels were his covering. And he was perfect until iniquity was found in him. Now, what he did, C, is Isaiah chapter 14. What he did is Isaiah chapter 14, beginning with verse 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, or how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, how you are weakened. You who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. North was always representative of heaven, and so he's going to go to the very heights of the north, the very heights of heaven. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest 
pits, lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness, who destroyed its cities, and who did not open the house of his prisoners? So what he did was begin to look at himself and begin to say, I am somebody and therefore I will accomplish these things and I will ascend to the, the farthest sides of the north and the heights of the clouds and I'll be like God. It's his original lie. That's the lie that he tried to pull in heaven and it wasn't, uh, they didn't, the, the heaven didn't buy it and it says in verse 15 that he shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit, cast out of heaven, and he tried to pull his lie in the Garden of Eden. He said before his fall, I'll be like the Most High. And then the first thing he did when he had a chance to get to Eve, it says, the reason why he doesn't want you to eat this fruit is because you'll be like him. You'll be like the Most High. So the same lie that he told himself, he tried to pass on to the creatures, to the creation of man. Okay, D, what he does now. Okay, who he was was an anointed cherub. What he did was look at himself and begin to uh, visualize himself as being something that he wasn't. And so he was cast out as a result. What he does now, Revela Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. He says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, remember one of his names is the accuser. That's what the word devil means. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. So one of the things that he's doing now is accusing the brethren. He's accusing the brethren. We can see that Satan right now is standing before God and every time one of us uh, mess up, he's up there saying, God, you see what he did? You see what he did then? You see that time when he did that double take on that girl? Or you see that time when he was uh, let that bad thought stay in his mind or he was flipping the channels and he let it stay on that movie? You see that time when he told that lie? He's standing before uh, the throne of God at this very minute trying to point out every fault we ever make. But then God, as those that are covered with the blood, looks down and says, all I see is Jesus. All I see is the blood of my son. And so the fact that he's standing before the throne right now accusing the brethren, the saints, it's doing him no good. But that's what he's doing. Then Ephesians 2 2, where he says that he is the prince and the power of the air. The prince of the power of the air. So he still has uh, authority. He hasn't been totally struck down yet. Okay, E, he's the father of lies. The father of lies. Let's turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8 dialogue that Jesus is having with the Pharisees uh, chapter 8 verse 44 let's back up to 42 the uh, Pharisees had tried to explain to him that uh, that they have but one father he says we're not born of fornication we have one father God and Jesus said to them if God were your father you would love me for I proceeded and came forth from proceeded forth and came from God nor have I come of myself but he sent me why do you not understand my speech because you are not able to listen to my word you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him and when he speaks a lie he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. What Jesus was trying to explain to them is that the Pharisees believed that because they were descendants of Abraham, 
that made them children of God. And because Abraham was declared righteous and all of the prophecies and promises of his covenant, that they were just automatically in. They were part of the in crowd. And Jesus was saying that you've missed the point. You missed the whole point about the promises and the covenant that were given to Abraham. And because of the fact that you refuse to see what the word actually says, you refuse to receive the truth, you refuse to receive me, Jesus said, as truth, because I am the truth. Your father isn't God, your father is the devil. Your father is Satan, who is a liar and the fa father of lies. Another scriptural references for, uh, reference for Satan being the father of lies is 2 Corinthians 11.4. But we won't take the time to look that up. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. Okay, F. His work. His work. The work of Satan. Number one, Daniel chapter 10, 11 to 14. Daniel 11... Or chapter 10, verse 11 and 14. This is on number 1. Daniel 10, 11. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have been sent to you. And while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Now this is a, a, an angelic being that had, had come to him. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, from fear. From, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been uh, left alone there with the kings of Persia. And now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days for the vision refers to many days yet to come so we can see that this angel had come to explain the visions to Daniel but he, he also explained that I had been here earlier but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days now whether or not this is a reference specifically to Satan or just one of his princes we don't know probably one of his agents probably one of his princes or one of his uh, emissaries. And the key thing to see from this passage is the fact that this spiritual warfare is going on right now. Even in this room, you know, if we could have our, our physical eyes peeled back and our spiritual eyesight opened up and we could see the fact that, that Satan and his followers are busy at work right now trying to mess with our heads and, and, and all of this is going on above us right now spiritual warfare and the angelic beings are there fighting on our side and trying to uh, to overcome them okay number two Matthew 13 19 Matthew 13 19 in the New Testament this is another example of Satan's work and this is probably where he is uh, most active at this point 13 19 Because this is this is the uh, this is the do or die point in Satan's work. He says, uh, verse eighteen. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. This is the parable of the sower in the soils. When anyone hears the word of God and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. So Jesus had explained earlier in this parable that some of the seed fell by the wayside. And that's where the hard ground was. And it would might, you know, take a real quick route. But uh, it w really wouldn't. It, because the ground was hard, it couldn't get the depth. And the birds would come and snatch it away. And he's saying that these are the ones that uh, Satan would come and rip people off. Before they had a chance to really take the gospel of Christ and put it in their hearts. And, and place their faith in it. And this is where, like I said, Satan is possibly most active now because he wants to get him before he loses him. And uh, any time that you have, uh, there's any kind of evangelistic outreach going on, that's when Satan is the most active. And you'll see a lot of times where that's where you run into more spiritual attacks and uh, because that's when the, the warfare is the heaviest. Okay, number three, 1 Peter 5.8. 
First Peter five eight. It's number three on your outline. He says First Peter five eight. Be sober and be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The word Satan means adversary. So he's saying, Satan, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And then Job 1.7, the story about, about Job where God uh, was holding a council with all the angels, and, and uh, Satan comes up and he says, So what have you been up to, Lucifer? And he said, I've just been going back and forth across the earth, just seeing what kind of mischief I can get into, seeing what kind of trouble I could have. And then God said, Well, in all of your goings back and forth, have you considered my servant Job? And then the whole thing about Satan said, Yeah, but it's because you've got this hedge about him that I can't get through. And so God tested Job, tried Job. Okay, G, his fate. The fate of Satan. Revelation chapter 20. Satan's fate is found in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever. So we see here uh, several things from this verse. One is that this lake of fire and brimstone is where Satan, the false prophet, and, and the beast will be cast into along with all of their followers and that this fire, of this lake of fire and brimstone will burn day and night forever. So if there are those today that teach that there's no such thing as hell, that at most there is an annihilation of existence where those that uh, aren't saved by the blood of Christ will be taken to a place where they'll be burned up. And then, you know, just like a piece of paper, you light a match to a piece of paper, and once it's burned up, it's gone. And this is their teaching of hell. But we can see here from this verse that it says they'll be tormented in this lake of fire day and night forever. And when we really stop and picture this, you know, we try to get a concept of our minds about a lake of fire. And then the fact that this lake of fire will burn forever. The flame never extinguishes. And that the, the, the beings that are cast into this lake of fire will be there for eternity. And Satan will be leading the, the mob. Okay, demons. You see in parentheses the word devils, and if you use the Old King James, the, this is the way that they're normally referred to, but this is actually a misnomer. Uh, this is from a, a Greek word that means demon. There's only one devil, and that's Satan. That's Lucifer. Okay, demons. There's no clear-cut explanation in Scripture as to where demons come from. Uh, there are various theories ancient pagan thought or contemporary pagan thought of the Bible when it was written the Greeks and so on had the idea that demons were uh, the spirits of uh, bad people you know when they weren't allowed to go to the to the place of rest and uh, to to their concept of heaven the bad people were sentenced to an existence here on earth just kind of floating around without any any uh, purpose or aim other than to just be bad. And so the demons that were inflicting people in this lifetime, they believed that this, these were the spirits of, of dead, evil people. Uh, another theory that is propounded even by Christians today is uh, that these are the disembodied spirits of a race, a pre-Adamic race, or a race that existed before Adam. Uh, these are the people that believe that there is a time period uh, between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2, in which that possibly God even had created another human race before Adam. And that because of the thing that took place in heaven with Satan's rebellion and everything, God wiped out the whole creation that he, he had up until that time, including some sort of pre-Adamic race or a race before Adam. 
and that the demons that are on the earth today are the disembodied spirits of this race. This is a very interesting theory, but there's absolutely no scriptural support for it at all. There's no scriptural references to any kind of pre-Adamic race at all, much less their disembodied spirits. Uh, a third theory on the origin of demons is that in Genesis chapter 6, let's turn to Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, just before the flood, Genesis chapter 6, there's, uh, God explains how depraved man had gotten, and what the purpose, or how depraved man had gotten, and the result of it. It says, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born of them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, this is verse 2, and they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Okay, the sons of God mated with the daughters of men. They chose wives from themselves of whom they chose. And then in verse 3 it says, And God said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he indeed is flesh, and yet his days shall be numbered 120 years. And then in verse 4 it talks about, And there were giants that dwelt in the earth, and afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children unto them. And these were the mighty men of old, men of renown. There are those that believe that these are the production of, of the offspring of these angels, the sons of God. Uh, some scholars believe that these were angels who came down and uh, mated with the daughters of men who would just be the human women. And that the, the, the offspring that they produced are the demons of today. They were born as giants and then as they died they, their spirits became the demons of today. Again, this is an interesting theory but it lacks a lot of solid uh, scriptural support. The fourth theory is that the demons and this is probably the most likely and the one that's best supported in Scripture, is that the demons that we read about in the New Testament are part of the band that fell with Satan in his rebellion. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 12 again. Revelation chapter 12. Referring to the one-third that fell with Satan. Revelations 12 verse 4. It's talking about the, the, the dragon and his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth and devour her child as soon as it was born. And then also in verse 7 and war broke out in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. So the predominant theory on the origin of demons are that when Satan led his rebellion in heaven, for some reason there were a certain amount, one-third of the number of angels, who thought that maybe he had a ghost of a chance of winning. And they, went with, they sided with him, and then they were all cast out. Satan and one-third of the angels. They were all cast out. Okay, number one, under A on demons, there are two classes. Two classes of demons. A, those that are bound in hell. And B, those who go forth with Satan. And we'll talk about both of them. There are two classes of demons. A, those that are bound in hell. And B, those who go forth with Satan. Okay, those that are bound in hell, let's turn to Jude, verse 6. Jude 6, the book before Revelation. And he talks about, in verse 6, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own habitation, he, res he has reserved in everlasting chains under the darkness of of the judgment of the great day. Okay. 
These are the angels that did not keep their proper domain or their proper estate, as the King James says. Their first estate. There are some who believe that... Uh, that these are the angels who were cast out and uh, that he has them reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Alright, a few books before that. Second Peter. Second Peter, verse 2. Or cha chapter 2, verse 4. Second Peter, chapter 2, verse 4. These are an, another example of the angels who are bound in hell. 2 Peter 2, 4 says, For God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Okay, so they've been cast down to hell, delivered unto chains of darkness to be reserved for, for judgment. Okay, B, those who go forth with Satan. Now we know that not all demons are bound up in hell. That there are demons running rampant even today. And we can see that in uh, those that go forth with Satan on B, Matthew 25. We'll just, there are many, many, many places in Scripture that these are referred to, but we'll just give one for a reference. Matthew 25. This is probably one of the best known references. Matthew 25, verse 41. He's, then he will say, he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you accursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the, for the devil and his angels. So this is the everlasting fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. These were the ones that went forth with, with, uh, with Satan. And Revelation 20, verse 10. Again, the lake of fire and the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, wherein the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever. These are those that went forth with Satan. Okay, angels and demons, predominantly demons, according to rabbinic thought, had a, uh, a hierarchy, had a structure of authority. And we can see this brought out, they have position. We can see this brought out in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, according to the traditional Jewish thought at this time, that these different references here about principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age were referring to uh, the privates and the sergeants and the captains and lieutenants of this uh, authority structure among demons. There's a book by a man named C.S. Lewis called The Screwtape Letters where he takes this thought and expands on it and uh, very effectively shows how through this hierarchy or through this structure of demons and how they, how they work among men to trip them up and to get them to mess up and to fall away. Okay, they have the ability to possess man or animal and to influence men. Number one, let's look up Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. Matthew 8, verse 28. This is on number one on demon possession. Matthew 8, 28. And when he had come to the other side, to the country of the Jergesenes, he met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one would pass that way. So here we see an example of demon possession, how demons had gone into the spirit of a human and taken control. 1 
1 Timothy 4 verse 1 talks about deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons. He says that, that in the last days that people will give themselves over to this sort of thing. Willingly. And we can see the rise in, uh, in Satan, Satanism and Satan worship today where people actually pray that Satan would possess them. That he would take over their being and he would guide them and direct them. And that they, in the same way that we look to the Holy Spirit as being our guide and, and, and our source and, and our way in this earth, they look to Satan as being the same way and pray to him that he would come in and possess them. Okay, number two on demon possession, 1 John 4.1. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 4. First John 4 1 Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit, whether they are of God, because many false prophets had gone out into the world. So John says, don't believe everything that comes along, because some of the things that appear to be spiritual are not from the Holy Spirit. And so you need to test them. See, do they lead toward God? Do they testify of of Christ and, and, and His accomplishment, what He did. Uh, many things are going on in the world today that uh, supposedly are from God. Many sorts of supernatural and spiritual encounters and, and all of the, uh, the, the prophecies that come out in National Enquirer and all this sort of thing. And anytime there's some sort of a, a Bible prediction that, that the, the National Star can get a hold of and say, this is, you know, the Bible fulfilled this and everything, check and see. And you think, well, it, you know, it's using a Bible verse to support it, so it must be of God. But check and see, what, what is this prophecy doing? And, and what is this spirit that supposedly is behind this? What is it accomplishing? Is it glorifying God or is it glorifying the national tattler? Is it glorifying God or is it glorifying Gene Dixon? You know, where does the glory... Uh, and what part does this have in God's plan? Because all prophecy, all prophetic scripture has something to do with God's plan. And not whether or not someone gets married before their 19th birthday or something like that. So he says, test the spirits, because not all the spirits are of God. And there are many false prophets and many deceiving spirits in the world today. And interestingly, D, they know their judgment. The spirits know that they've had it. And this is examples again in Matthew 8, 29 with the, where the, the demon possessed men uh, when, when Christ went to cast them out they said, why have you come to torment us before our time? And then he, you know, cast them out. So they know that their end is destruction. But the demon's desire as emissaries of Satan is to take as many with them as they can. And that's they, they are bent on this one purpose to take as many people with them as they can. Now, as far as the, the, those that are bound in hell and those that have been released to wreck all this havoc on mankind, uh, which are which, Scripture is fairly silent on. There are some theories uh, that are just nothing more than that, just conjecture and commentary. Some of the theories are that the demons that have been cast out are then the ones that are being bound. Once they've been cast out, then they're set to, to be bound in chains of darkness. But that's just simply a theory. Okay, angels and their relationship to men. Angels work to help the followers of God, but they are used by God to punish disobedience. So angels can be a help as well as an act of God's judgment. As we saw a couple of examples, for example, Balaam in the Old Testament. And we'll just go, few, uh, go over uh, these six that are listed here. Uh, 2 Kings 19.35. 2 Kings 19.35 is Hezekiah. This is King Hezekiah when he was uh, doing battle with the His Assyrians, greatly outnumbered. Greatly outnumbered. And during the night, the angel of the Lord came and killed 180,000 Assyrians just in one swipe. 
They killed 180,000 Assyrians. He passed judgment on the Assyrians and they were all wiped out at once. Now Herodotus, the Greek historian, he gives an account of this and he talks about the fact where well, they all died of this plague. There were some infected mice and rats that got into the camp and they all came and, and uh, of course, Herodotus was a pagan. He didn't, he didn't worship Jehovah, but he tried to give a natural explanation as to what happened. And, you know, if God wanted to use some sort of a viral plague to wipe out 187 or 180,000 Assyrians, he's got the sovereignty to do that. But the thing that Herodotus doesn't even attempt to explain is the fact that they all died in a single night. You know, the, this, and they died just before they went to battle. The timing and, and, and the magnitude of, of this whole thing is just definitely from God. So he sent his angel and they killed 180,000 at one time. Okay, that was Second Kings 19.35. Number two, First Chronicles 21.15. First Chronicles 21.15. This is King David after he's beginning to feel his oaths as a king and believing that he's the one that's going to be calling the shots. He decides it's time to take a census, which was against God's will and against God's uh, plan and purpose. And God got pretty angry by it. And so there were a lot of people that died as a result of an angel coming and uh, passing judgment on the people. Let's turn to uh, number three, Psalms 91, verse 11. Psalms 91, verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. This is where the idea of the guardian angels come from. Guardian angels. There is scriptural support for the, for the doctrine of guardian angels. It says that, that he, they've been given charge over us to watch over us. And we don't know, you know, we don't have really any concept of, uh, a, a true full concept anyway, of that spiritual warfare that goes on around us. And the fact that we, you know, have these angels that have been given charge over us to watch over us and protect us. So number three, the scriptural reference is Psalm 9111, that angels are given for protection. Given for protection. Okay, number four, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 9. 1 Corinthians 4 9. It says, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death, for we have been made a spectacle. This literally means a theater. We have been made a theater to the world both to angels and men. So Paul's saying that he's talking about himself and the other apostles, the, 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 the lot, the, the, the cards that they had been dealt from God as far as their, their position in God's plan, that the whole world, including the angels, the whole cosmos, were just kind of sitting back and watching this play unfold before their eyes. So we're watched by angels also. And then the entire book of Revelation, like I said earlier, this would be number, number uh, five. Just the entire book of Revelation. Angels uh, deal very predominantly in, in that book as uh, emissaries and agents of God's judgment. He would use the angels to pour out the bowls and the vials, uh, to blow the trumpets and to unroll the scrolls and so on and so forth. So number five is the book of Revelation. Angels being used to uh, disperse judgment. And then lastly, number six, we have Luke 15, verse 7. Let's all turn to that one. Luke 15, verse 7. And I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So every time someone comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, every time someone repents from his sins and accepts Christ as his Lord and Savior, they, they just party down in heaven. All of the angels uh, 
says there's more joy over just one of those than all of the good people that are on the earth who feel like they don't need repentance. And all of the good deeds and, and uh, all of the philanthropists and, and all of these people that go about thinking that they're going to make this place a better world to live by their efforts. He says you can have a hundred of them, but you just have one person who says, I'm a sinner and I need God and I'm going to accept the gift that he's given me. The angels will rejoice more over that than all of the good deeds that can ever be done on earth. Okay, so we have a, a very surface overview of the doctrines of angels here. Uh, many, many verses, many that we didn't go into. But we can see that angels have a purpose in God's plan. That, that he had a specific reason for, for creating them. Uh, and in his sovereignty and in his omniscience and in his foreknowledge, he knew how the whole thing would come down with Satan and, and his rebellion and the demons that went with him and the relationship that they would have with us on the earth. But we can also see that he gave us guardian angels and that as, as we focus on this warfare that's going on, this spiritual warfare, the one thing that we need to keep in mind is that the battle's already been won. You know, just like the guy says, I've read the, the end of the book and, and the, the chapter 20 scene with the lake of fire. We already know how it's going to come out, and so we don't need to fear it. And we can just trust again in his finished work because it will come to pass. Let's pray. Father, help us to understand angels and their role in our lives and the way that they they work, uh, help us to have a proper understanding and a proper balance and to form correct doctrine so that we might rightly divide your word and, and not get off in tangents as, as so many other of our brothers and sisters have done. Uh, put in us a desire, Lord, to search these things out for ourselves and not just accept something that we might read in an article or a book or something, but that we would really see what your word has to say about these beings that you've created and that we might see how that relates to us and how we might apply them to our lives that we might use the angels to draw us closer to you and that that might be the ultimate goal that we have in everything we do and say as Bible students, as believers and just as your children. In Jesus' name, amen.